just heard my self-designed custom guitar amplifier, and here are the PCBs I had manufactured by GLC PCB. In this video I'd like to walk you through my design choices for the power amplifier section of my guitar amplifier. Thank you to GLC PCB for sponsoring this video. I had a two layer PCB made for this amplifier, and you can get them for as low as $2 from GLC PCB. Additionally, every user gets these $8 coupons to use for SMT assembly. Without further ado, let's get started with analyzing this amplifier. Here is the block diagram of the entire guitar amplifier. Pretty standard as far as guitar amplifiers go. We'll quickly go through it here, but the main focus will then be on analyzing the power amplifier circuitry. The guitar has a relatively high output impedance, something like 15 kilo ohms for humbucking style pickups, so we'll need a high impedance input buffer uh, over here. In this design, I used the JFET stage to give me 500 kilo ohms input impedance. Then the signal is fed into two separate preamp channels, one clean and one distorted. I can then switch between the channels using a foot switch and a relay. Once the channel has been selected, the output is fed into a set of tone controls to alter the frequency response. Additionally, there's a foot switchable effects loop, again using a relay. Before we get to the power amplifier, we use a master volume control to set the overall signal level going into the power amplifier. I spec the power amplifier to be operating in class AB to give me just under 10 watts RMS power into an 8 ohm load. The power amplifier can handle loads as low as 4 ohms. Now let's take a look at the power amplifier schematic. Here is the full schematic for the power amplifier. I designed this from scratch, first via calculations and simulations, then breadboarding and finally layout in KiCad. A typical power amplifier can be divided into three sections. The long-tailed pair or differencing amplifier, the class A amplifier and biasing stage, and lastly, the output stage. Effectively, you can see this as a discrete op-amp with a very powerful output section. I designed the amplifier to run off of a single DC power supply, not a split supply, so extra care was needed with biasing. Let's start at the long-tailed pair. Its job is to take the input, subtract from it a part of the output, that is to apply negative feedback, and then amplify it. I've biased the long-tailed pair base to essentially half the supply voltage via R1 and R2. C1 prevents any DC bias from the previous stage interfering with this stage, and also together with R1 and R2 forms a high-pass filter, thus defining the lower end of the bandwidth of the amplifier. R3, C2, and R4 are used to prevent RF oscillations, as well as to limit the upper bandwidth. The centerpiece, effectively, is Q3 and Q4, these PNP transistors. For large gain, I've used the current sync load, that is Q5 and Q6, and to improve the common mode rejection ratio, I've used the current source, or rather current mirror, via Q1 and Q2 up here. R5 sets the current through the long-tailed pair. I've added a small amount of emitted degeneration to the current sources, that is R6, R7, R8, and R9, and this helps with the matching of the transistors. An important part of the long-tailed pair is the feedback network given by R10, R11, and C3. At DC, C3 is effectively an open circuit, and thus the whole output voltage is applied pretty much to the base of Q4. The negative feedback thus ensures that the amplifier's DC output level is then at the base voltage of Q3, that is, half the supply voltage. At AC, however, C3 is effectively a short circuit, and the voltage seen at the base over here is divided down by a ratio of R10 and R11, like in a potential divider. This network then sets our closed loop gain. In this case, at AC, we have approximately 27 dB. The output of the long-tailed pair is then fed into a Class A amplifier, composed of Q10 in a common emitter configuration, with a current source consisting predominantly of Q7 and Q8, acting as an active load to increase the gain. We want high open loop gain overall on the system, so that we get a much better performance when we close the feedback loop. The most important part of this stage is actually the capacitor C4, which gives us dominant pole compensation often also called Miller compensation. We need to do this as we are designing a high open loop gain amplifier with a substantial amount of phase shift. We need to limit the frequency response of the amplifier via C4 
to ensure stability when we close the loop. Essentially, C4 ensures that the open loop gain is rolled off below 0 dB before the phase shift has reached minus 180 degrees. C4 seems like a very small value at about 100 picofarads, however its value is actually magnified by the Miller effect. That is, the capacitance value is pretty much multiplied by the gain of the class A stage. Part of this stage of the power amplifier is also the biasing section in between the common emitter amplifier and the current source. I've used a VBE multiplier in combination with a trim pot P1 to give me a tunable bias voltage. In essence, the VBE multiplier, as the name implies, gives me a multiple of the base emitter voltage, but it's actually seen between the collector and emitter, depending on the ratio of R15 and P1. So you can theoretically bias the amplifier anywhere from class A to class B. D1 and D2 are there to limit the bias voltage to a maximum of two diode drops, such that we don't excessively turn on the output devices at idle levels. We finally arrive at the third section of the power amplifier, the output stage. This is pretty much where all of the heavy lifting occurs, so to speak. Q13 and Q14, as well as Q15 and Q16, are complementary feedback pairs, or sick light pairs, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And these act as power emitter followers. We have large output devices, Q14 and Q16, and slightly smaller output devices, Q13 and Q15. The complementary feedback pair has very high linearity, but you can sometimes have trouble with RF oscillations in comparison to a typical Darlington configuration. I've used R17 and R25 base stopper resistors to mitigate these effects to a degree. The output of the complementary feedback pairs are joined via a very small value, but large size emitter resistors R19 and R24. For the sake of stability, I've added a Zobel network at the output to make sure the amplifier is stable for any sensible speaker load attached. C6 removes the DC bias apparent at the output, and R29 is used to pull one side of the capacitor to the ground to provide a charging and discharging path. Speakers are predominantly inductive loads, and inductors severely dislike having the current to them interrupted. When this does happen, they will produce large voltage spikes. Therefore, I've included the diodes D5 and D6 to catch these spikes and shunt them to the supply rails. Lastly, even though the amp is intrinsically short circuit protected via C6, I've included VI limiting to prevent damage to the output devices, and you can see that here and here. For example, for a given current flowing through R19, we will develop a corresponding voltage across it. This voltage is then sensed and divided down via R20 and R21 and applied to the base of Q11. Q11 requires about 0.7 volts turned on. And when it does turn on, uh, due to a large current flowing through R19, it will steal base current effectively away from Q13, and thus start to turn off the output devices. The circuit here is then mirrored with Q12 down here. D3 and D4 are included to make sure we aren't forward biasing the base collector junctions of these transistors. So here we are in KiCad, and this is the whole amplifier schematic, and we look pretty much at this power amplifier section over here. So that's we discuss what we discussed in the schematics. The layout isn't too hard, it's pretty straightforward. I've just made sure all the, th the devices that get hot, that they have space and room to breathe, and now that I'm able to attach, for example, heat sinks and stuff like that to these larger output devices. I've chosen, of course, larger resistors where larger currents will flow. And yeah, and everything that shouldn't get hot, I've placed a bit further away. Current sources I've tend to group together, so matching pairs of transistors I've grouped together to make sure they have similar temperatures. Um, I've also put the VBE multiplier transistor close to one of the smaller drivers of the complementary feedback pair just to make sure it senses the temperature. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing too crazy about this layout. Pretty simple. And yeah, so thank you for watching. If you like the video, please leave a like. If you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe. And yeah, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you very much.